So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, welcome to Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. I'm your host, Robin Norgren. I'd like to start with some thoughts from a book called Walking on Water. Lewis Carroll was a storyteller, an artist, as well as a mathematician. And artists often have a more profound sense of what time is all about than do the scientists. There's a story of a small village about the size of the village near Crosswicks, where lived an old clockmaker and repairer. When anything was wrong with any of the clocks or watches in the village, he was able to fix them, to get them working properly again. When he died, leaving no children and no apprentice, there was no one left in the village who could fix clocks. Soon, various clocks and watches began to break down. Those which continued to run often lost or gained time, so they were of very little use. A clock might strike midnight at three in the afternoon. So many of the villagers abandoned their timepieces. One day, a renowned clockmaker and repairer came through the village, and the people crowded around him and begged him to fix their broken clocks and watches. He spent many hours looking at all the faulty timepieces, and at last he announced that he could repair only those whose owners had kept them wound because they were the only ones which would be able to remember how to keep time. So we must daily keep things wound. That is, we must pray when prayer seems dry as dust. We must write when we are physically tired, when our hearts are heavy, when our bodies are in pain. We may not always be able to make our clock run correctly, but at least we can keep it wound so that it will not forget. Priscilla Shearer, in her book Awaken, says, Looking and seeing are two different things. They represent the same gap in attention that exists between hearing and listening. One is merely the physical, almost involuntary action of a functioning human body, while the other action requires the willing cooperation of the heart. Many a rebellious teenager has acceded to the former, looking, not seeing, hearing, not listening, while showing little interest or regard for the latter. In fact, many a rebellious grown-up has done it too, if we're being quite honest about it. This duplicious posture is the stock in trade of the busy, the self-consumed, and the haughtily superior. Whenever we're certain that our own schedules and reputations are the most important to maintain, we lack the sensitivity and compassion needed to pay attention to what someone else is saying and truly digest what they're communicating. We fail to see, to really see, what's happening in someone else's heart, and thus we fail to offer sympathy, compassion, and resolution. Luke 7, 44. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? In this biblical moment from Luke 7, Simon the Pharisee had just witnessed the shocking spectacle of a lewd woman sneaking uninvited into his home during a dinner party and pouring her worshipful tears and perfume on the feet of Jesus. Every eye in the room had looked on, including Simon's, horrified, taken aback. They all saw her, 
but Jesus specifically asked Simon to look again. Because if he could really see her, he would know that this woman, this unsavory-looking woman, had come seeking forgiveness from her Savior. She had come seeking forgiveness for sins no worse or more heinous than those committed by the smug and self-righteous. And if he had seen this in her, rather than merely gawking at her, his hypocrisy would have melted into humility. His critique would have morphed into compassion. His inclination for judging would have turned the camera of inspection toward himself so that he could have walked out of that place with the same gift she did, saving faith and blessed peace from Jesus himself. How different would your relationships and encounters with others be if you, by God's Spirit, could heighten your looking into seeing? How much more fruitful could your personal impact become on an everyday basis if you elevated your hearing into listening? You would become a choice instrument in the hand of God, prepared for His purposes, propelled by His passion, moved to displays of grace and mercy toward the hurting victims of a lost and dying world. As you walk into the coming days, don't just look. See. Ask the Lord to give you eyes of a discernment to detect layers below the surface and to respond in a way that will honor Him and bless others. Kim Rosen in her book, Saved by a Poem, says, I took many poems to heart. Some I committed to memory and others I, others became companions and guides for me from the page. I realized that learning the poems by heart were only, was only a part of the experience that was quietly, inexorably freeing me from the grip of the depression. More impactful than having the poems in my memory was the experience of living them, inviting them into my voice, body, feelings, and thoughts, where they were causing profound shifts in my energy and consciousness. I was returning to a forgotten language that had once been mine. The poems seemed to know me better than I knew myself. They sparked insights and reflected my deepest feelings more intimately than words alone could touch. For though a poem is made of words, what touches us is between and beyond them. The words might be simple or, or complex. Of themselves, they have no magic. But together, the words become part of the structure that encloses intimate space. Once again, I was realizing that I had dis what I had discovered as a teenager. It is po possible to speak the mystery, the silence, the unnameable joys and sorrows of my inner reality. To touch the wordless through a gathering of words. I have experienced this phenomenon, even in poems that have no intention of being spiritual. There are moments when an unexpected metaphor, or the startling way a poet uses a word, or the rhythm of a particular phrase takes you by surprise, and suddenly you have fallen into yourself, freed of the trappings of your mind. It can happen in a mystical poem by Catherine of Siena from the 14th century. There the soul dwells like the fish in the sea and the sea in the fish. Or one by Lucy Clifton, written in 1996 on her father's 90th birthday. What he has forgotten is more than I have seen. What I have forgotten is more than I can bear. The mind meets something. It can't conceive of, and yet, conception occurs. A completely new, yet somehow remembered experience is born. There is a gasp a closing of eyes, a sense of being recognized by this stranger, the poem. As I took more and more poems into my life, what began as a self-prescribed therapy for depression became the unwitting discovery of a transformational path. It turned out that receiving a poem so completely caused profound shifts in my consciousness. 
Some of this came through the self-inquiry required to find the authentic experience of each word of the poem within me. Some of it came through the transformative power of the body of the poem as it entered my body. The rhythm of it beating in my pulse. The lines and phrases changing my breathing. The song of the consonants, vowels, and rhymes making music on my tongue. Some of it came through giving my voice to the voice of the poem, which required dissolving restrictions that had censored my sound since I was a toddler. Rumi's words, forget your life, say God is great, get up, summoned a jubilant demand I never before permitted myself to express. A poem by W.B. Yeats brought a raunchy seductiveness into my voice that I didn't know I had within me. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. For nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. A spontaneity and freedom was returning to my life, poem by poem. The depression that had cloaked me was lifting. Somewhere in those miles of macadam, I discovered a very particular path for taking poetry into my life as a transformative agent. I say I discovered it because the experience was less an act of invention than it was like coming upon an intricate background city, underground city, and meticulously brushing the dust off its elaborate mosaic walls. And this discovery was changing the very shape of my life. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. If you'd like to find more of the work that I'm doing, you can look online on Instagram, and I have all my links there under the handle at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. Mm-hmm.